If you and your fellow campers wandered onto the property of a pair of cannibalistic mutant giants, what would you do? Summer camp is supposed to be a carefree time full of campfire s'mores and swimming in the lake. Unless you're in Poland at an addiction camp for teens who are just too attached to their cell phones. Then you're sent off into the woods to take on rednecks, touchy priests, and two hungry hillbilly versions of Gregor Clegane. Let's see if we can survive our hike intact. I'm going to break down the mistakes made by our campers, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the mutant twins in Nobody Sleeps in the Woods Tonight. Back in the 90s, a postman arrives to a cabin in the Polish woods. Inside, a blood-splattered woman washes bloody clothes in an old wash basin. The postman hears moaning from the crawl space under the house and calls out. He rips off a wooden panel under the house and crawls inside. He tells someone inside to grab his hand, but when they won't, he turns to go get help and gets yanked under the house by his ankles. 30 years later, a bus full of screen junkie teens drives deep into the heart of the forest. They arrive to Camp Adrenaline, where a salty guy called The Keeper signs them in and takes all their electronics. After lights out, the blood-splattered lady from the original cabin tries to feed a pig to the person in the basement. She pulls too hard and accidentally sends herself careening down the stairs. A snarling thing kills her and escapes the basement. It should go without saying that learning to mind your own business is a timeless survival strategy. Strategy. It's one thing to notice an unconscious person through a window and call out for help. It's another to circle a house and pull off a panel skirting when you hear someone moan. This man should have hopped back on his little bicycle and ridden into town for help, rather than going into the crawl space alone. Back in the early 90s, Poland had just under 5 million phones for its population of 38 million people, which means there was only a 1 in 8 chance that this house had a phone to call for reinforcements, even if he did find someone who needed help. As for Mama Butcher and her pig, well, this appears to be a wild boar, which is smaller than other pig species at around 180 pounds, but it's still big enough to be a hassle for an elderly woman. That said, it's better and safer for her to push down the stairs, even if it's more work ultimately, because she can control the pig's body and because it prevents her from becoming a human meat popsicle for the mutants in the basement. The simpler solution is to just butcher the pig into pieces before tossing them down the hole, if you're dead set on feeding your deranged basement children. Personally, I'd lock the house up, light my house on fire, book a cross-country flight to a place where nobody knew who I was, and just start fresh. In the morning, a Catholic priest blesses the campers and purges them of their so-called electronic addiction. Iza arrives wearing a giant backpack and takes Inyella, Zoja, Ulick, Bartek, and Daniel to begin a three-day hike. With nothing else to do, Bartek starts taunting Daniela for being a cyclist. Danielle shoves Bartek in retaliation, sending him tumbling down a hill. Iza bandages his bleeding leg, but when she can't tear the bandage by hand to tie it, Zoja reveals she's carrying a retractable knife and cuts it for Iza. Meanwhile, Ulick stumbles across a disemboweled elk carcass crawling with red maggots. Iza tells the group it must have been a predator that killed it. Ulick grumbles that 15,000 people in Poland disappear every year, and 5,000 of those go missing in the woods. Unseen by the others, Zoja notices a blood-stained disembodied hand scratch itself around the trunk of a narrow tree. Iza tells them animals don't attack without reason, assuring the kids that the forest gods will protect them. And so the group treks deeper into the woods. Talk of forest gods aside, nature is brutal and predators have to eat, so seeing a dead prey species like this isn't surprising. However, at minimum, Iza should be carrying pepper spray, which is legal for anyone over the age of 18 in Poland, and she should probably tell everyone to pick up a walking stick for added protection just in case. She should also double Double check that everyone knows how to return to the main camp if they get separated. They don't seem to be hiking along a designated trail, which makes it even more important to make sure that they know how to work a compass, know which direction to run for help, and to have a map on them. Zoja should also tell the others that she saw something, perhaps not a disembodied hand, but telling them she saw something moving nearby might convince Iza to call off the hike and to return to the safety of the camp, just in case. At golden hour, the group makes camp, and Yella simps Daniel into building her tent for her while she goes swimming in a nearby lake. Iza builds a fire and goes around the circle getting everyone to talk about their so-called addiction. 
In the middle of the night, Daniel sneaks out of his tent to smoke a little green by the lake, and Yella joins him. Later, while sleeping alone by the lake in his sleeping bag, Daniel pulls out a contraband phone. He doesn't see the mutant, who suddenly descends on him like a mountain troll, picking him up in his sleeping bag and slamming him to death against a tree, Jason Voorhees style. Unfortunately for Daniel, these are the daintiest giant mutants outside of Fallout 4, capable of sneaking up on a man as silently as a predator. The mutant attacks so fast, Daniel has no way of defending himself here, except by screaming to alert the others, which he doesn't really even have a chance to do that either. Daniel was just screwed. In a nightmare, we learn Zoja's family died in a semi-truck collision. Turns out it was her parents who had the technology addiction, and it ended up costing them their lives. When she wakes, she overhears that Daniel has disappeared, and Yella shows everyone the spot by the water where she last saw Daniel, but he isn't there. Then, Zoja finds blood on the tree nearby. Izzy tells Aniela and Bartek to stay at the camp just in case Daniel returns. Meanwhile, Izzy, Zoja, and Ulick search the woods. Ulick wants to call the cops, warning everyone that people who split up in horror movies tend to die. On the hike, he warns them about the six sins of horror. One, curiosity. Two, disbelief. Three, confidence. Four, the unattractive always die. Five, romance is fatal. And six, splitting up just like they're currently doing. They arrive to the cabin in the woods. Ulick wants to run, but Izza pushes forward. No one answers their knock at the door, so the trio venture inside. They spot dead animals and a portrait of twin boys on the wall. When Ulick votes to go back to the camp, they hear something coming from the basement hatch. Izza and Zoja tiptoe down and discover Daniel's body. Ulick calls out that someone has come home, and the three hide in the basement. Giant plodding footsteps above send dust down on their heads. The hatch opens, and the mutant trundles down. Izza Claws the wooden hatch on the side of the house open, and Zoja and Ulick climb out. Suddenly, Daniel's cell phone rings. With too little time for all of them to make it out, Izzy decides to face the brute and arms herself with a stick. The mutant advances, and a moment later, tosses Izzy's head at Zoja and Ulick's feet. This is the point at which this so-called camp counselor should be pulling out the emergency phone you know she would have brought out with her. She doesn't even have a walkie-talkie. It's nuts that she has no means of communication with the other adults, and it makes it even crazier that she splits up these kids and goes off on a search and rescue mission by herself. It's also stupid because, as we'll learn in a few minutes, this camp trip is happening within walking distance of police officers and a church. Without more to go off of, is his first step after Daniel disappears should be to go for help by returning to the main camp. She's not a trained tracker, and she has four other teenage campers in tow, all of whom needs to be secured before she goes anywhere to look for Daniel. Returning to camp also means that she can grab some phones, and at least a half a dozen other adults, and call the police before conducting her search. Going into someone's house like this is just an obvious no, but especially in Poland, which has even more intense stand-your-ground laws than certain U.S. states. Knock on the door, call out for Daniel, and if no one answers, leave and return with reinforcements later. If you are going to trespass in someone else's house, have someone like Ulick stand to look out outside near the forest, out of sight. From there, he could intercept any normal-looking people who come to the house and tell them why he's there, avoiding the misunderstanding of finding a bunch of strangers snooping inside their house. He would also be able to call out a warning once an ogre arrived and draw the mutant into the forest, giving Izza and Zoja a chance to escape. This is doubly important because these idiots immediately head for the basement without knowing that there's actually a way to escape down there. They lucked out with a window, but only if they actually use it. I would have been out that window in two seconds after that first thunderous footstep sent dust cascading down down over my head. Is is an idiot, and these kids probably stand a better chance without her holding them back. Having said that, what was Ulick thinking? He just went over the six sins of horror. He's going to die not taking his own advice. Back at camp, Bartek and Aniela are bonding. When he turns and discovers a second ninja mutant as silently impaled Aniela through the back of the head and out through her mouth, Bartek races into the woods as the mutant tosses her body onto the beach. He arrives at the priest's church and asks for a phone. The priest lies and says, they aren't working. He begins to caress Bartek's head. Suddenly, the phone he said was broken begins to ring, forcing the priest to knock Bartek unconscious with a wooden crucifix. Bartek then wakes up tied to a chair with the ball gag in his mouth. The priest hears a noise outside and goes to investigate, finding someone has turned on the wood chipper. The priest advances, missing the 400-pound mutant who silently sneaks up behind him and gouges out his eyes. The mutant feeds his body through the chipper. In the church, Bartek struggles out of his restraints, seeing the mutant 
coming, he hides in a confessional booth. The mutant lumbers inside and sniffs him out. Either these are ninja mutants or everyone in Poland is deaf. I'm not sure which. It's pretty hard to prepare an attack for someone you can't hear coming. You also can't prepare for the handsy priest. This church should be a sanctuary, and Bartek had no way of knowing another evil waited him inside. If he had, he could have gone straight for the priest's car to see it was open, and if the keys were inside. Once Bartek wakes up, he needs to break his rope restraints and get to the working phone immediately. He's bound behind his back with a quarter inch thick rope. To help loosen the rope, he needs to push his hands outward against the rope again and again. This should create slack between the loops. While he's doing that, he should use his fingers to wiggle under the closest loop of the rope to potentially grab it and start uncoiling it once the rope is loose enough. If he can, he should also try to turn so he can use the sharper edge of the chair to help cut the rope. The bigger thing though is that his ankles aren't bound, which means you can also seek out an even sharper edge along the confessional box, the altar, or even a crucifix somewhere to help cut faster. Once you're free, barricade the church doors with chairs to prevent the priest or mutants from entering and then call the European emergency number 112 or 997 for help. Though I'm sure that's wrong and someone in the comments will correct me. Try to avoid hiding in a box full of holes unless it's literally your only option. Instead, hide behind the altar or look for any flagpoles or metal or wooden crucifixes that you can wield as a weapon. Better yet, maintain open sight lines by getting out into the open. These things are huge, surprisingly stealthy, but as slow as you'd expect a 500 pound monstrosity to be. We can outrun them if we see them. We can't really fight them, which means hiding in the confession booth is a death sentence. Also because it's literally the first place anyone would check. Hey, can I pull you to the side for a second? How are you enjoying the free gamer sub samples? Oh, you like them? That's just tickling to hear. One more question. Did you really think that shit was strings free? That you could just sip on that sweet guacamole gamer fart 9000, gain a mental advantage over your coworkers, your competitors, your opponents, your enemies, and I wouldn't come to collect my cut? You know, my great great grandfather always used to say, you fool me, we can't get fooled again. Well, I'm not a fucking fool, and if I don't see some orders rolling in for 100 round cans of succulent pineapple cocktail or punchy blue raz, people are gonna start having tragic accidents. I'll give you one last chance. Right now, until July 31st, there's a sale going on. Spend $100, get a free gaming sleeve. I'll even let you use my code unbeaten again for 10% off since I'm such a nice guy. Your loyalty is appreciated. Zoja and Ulick stumble upon a hermit's cabin. He warns the kids that the mutants crippled him years before. We flash back to when the mutants were little boys. An explosion in the sky draws them to a meteorite that crashed in the forest. When the boys go to bed, the meteorite opens and black ooze flows out and takes over their bodies. In the morning, their mother follows a trail of bloody bits and pieces to the basement, where she finds them ravenously feasting on the remains of their dog. She locks them inside. Hermit story hour ends, and Zoja decides his meager offerings of shelter food and a ratty old 12-gauge shotgun aren't tempting enough to shelter in place. She wants to go back to the cabin of the hangry ogres to get Daniel's phone. He warns them it's two days to the nearest town. Apparently, these mutants are what happened when the thing from Chronicle gives you all the wrong superpowers. Story or not, this hermit can't be trusted. He was attacked by the mutants before and never alerted local or national police to their existence. He's also exaggerated the distance to the nearest town. Poland is a square, approximately 400 by 430 miles. Even if it would take a feeble elderly guy two days to walk to town, two healthy teenagers could likely walk a solid 50 miles in a day if they push themselves. Staying isn't an option either, because the twins are no longer chained up in Mama Butcher's basement. They're roaming through the forest, wood chipping and beheading anyone they find. It's only a matter of time before they come here looking for their next plaything. There's no rest for the hunted until the the hunters are dead. Instead, I might play along with the hermit and agree to stay, then pepper him with questions. Be crafty here, act sympathetic. Convince him you're scared and ask where the mutant's house is in relation to this cabin, so when you leave, you can head in the opposite direction. It also wouldn't be a terrible idea to stay and wait until he puts the shotgun down or falls asleep. Then, you could grab the shotgun and use it to defend yourself while you try to get help. Going back to the cell phone is dangerous, and by this point, you have no way of knowing if it even has charge left. It would be better to arm yourself and find the nearest paved road and follow it to the next town or flag down cars 
when you see them. When Zoja and Ulick arrive at the twins' cabin, they find a mutant sectioning off pieces of Daniel's body. Ulick decides to be bait so Zoja can sneak in. She gives him her knife, and he struts away to the front of the house, where he draws the mutant's attention outside. When the mutant walks upstairs, Zoja enters through the crawlspace window and finds the cell phone. Unfortunately, the mutant is watching from the stairs. Before Zoja can crawl out, he pulls her back in. Ulick rushes down the stairs and stabs the mutant in the back. The mutant knocks Zoja out, then turns and stabs the knife into Ulick's belly before leaning in and ripping out Ulick's tongue with its teeth. Turns out, Silent But Deadly is the perfect description for these two big boys. When this is all over, I'm sure some secret organization is going to come recruiting. The plan to use Ulick as bait and sneak in isn't terrible, it's just poorly executed. Instead of going to the front door, Ulick should scream for the mutant's attention or throw rocks at the windows while standing outside the fenced-in yard of the cottage so he can run freely when the mutant emerges. Zoja should not go inside until she sees the mutant leave the house herself. Once inside, it should literally be a two-step process, grab the phone, and get the hell out again. There is no need to check if it works here. Once she's trapped, Ulick should aim for the mutant's neck or the mutant's femoral artery in its leg instead of his meaty middle. He should also hold onto the knife firmly and stab repeatedly until the mutant drops, twisting the blade with each thrust to cause the most penetrating damage. The goal here isn't to just get him to drop Zoja, it's to make sure he can't chase after them when she's free. And I hope I don't have to say this, but if you're going to stab somebody, don't announce your presence, and don't wait for your target to stab you back afterwards. Zoja wakes up chained to the wall. She finds Ulick stuck with the knife still impaled in his stomach. She pulls out Daniel's cell phone. It requires a thumbprint, so she uses Daniel's severed hand, only for the phone to immediately die. She tries to comfort Ulick, but he begs her to kill him. He guides her hand to the knife in his stomach three times before she finally twists it in deeper, and he dies. Time passes. Zoja tries to pick the lock with her knife. Eventually, it works. She rushes for the window, then turns back. Under Daniel's meat rack, she finds a machete-type blade. She opens the basement hatch and crawls out as quietly as she can. Machete in hand, she stalks towards the mutant Ulick stabbed and plunges the blade again and again into his body until he's dead. Running away is Zoja's best option here once she frees herself from the chain. She's outnumbered, exhausted, and out of her element. Having said that, since she's chosen violence, a surprise attack is her best option here. The problem is, from the basement, she has no way of knowing that the mutant is asleep or how his body is oriented in the house above her. She should crawl out through the hole in the crawl space and then find the best point of attack first before approaching the slumbering giant to finish him off. Instead of going for his gut, she should aim for his head, either plunging the blade straight into his eyes to prevent him from retaliating, or slicing his throat open very deeply to leave no room for air afterwards. Plunging for the stomach allows him to retaliate before Zoja has the chance to stab him again. And like I told you in Sweetheart, once the lumbering troll is down, decapitate him for good measure. We may not want to take his head home as a souvenir, but it's the best way to make sure he's down for good. Zoja runs through the Sapia woods until she's forced to walk from exhaustion. At the hermit's cabin, the hermit aims his gun as someone slips onto his porch and turns his door handle. The hermit fires, and something spills to the ground outside. He ventures outside to find Bartek, bleeding from a gunshot wound to his chest. In moments, Bartek is dead. This trigger-happy hermit is going to jail. Poland's stand your ground laws don't cover open, unprotected front doors. What was this guy thinking? He knows the mutants are free, so this door should be locked if not barricaded. He also knows that there's two kids running around in the woods who know where his house is. He should have stood up and looked through the side windows to see who was there, before firing blindly through the door. As for Bartek, use your words. We learned this in kindergarten. He should approach the house with extreme prejudice, calling out not only to see if anyone's inside, but to force them to call back so he knows they aren't mutated behemoths. Or, you know, he could knock like a normal person. Nearby, a cop waxes poetic to an impatient lady. When she leaves, he settles in with a book when he's interrupted by Zosha at his window screaming for help. She collapses into his arms. The cop puts her in the back and speeds down the forest road. He's so distracted, he drives over something bulky and gets out to see what it was. Zoja bangs on the window to get his attention, but he doesn't listen. The remaining mutant rises to his feet and slices the cop in half from head to groin with a battle axe. Then, the mutant stalks towards the cop car. Zoja tries to break the metal grate between the front and back seat before kicking out the window with her feet. She gets into the driver's seat and tries to start the car as the mutant climbs over the trunk and begins hacking away at the roof. Finally, she gets the car to start and peels out, knocking him off the hood. 50 feet away, she slams on the brakes and reverses, rolling over the
the mutant twice before speeding away into the end credits. All right, I might be siding with the ogre here. That battle axe bisection was awesome. This cop seems like a lost cause before he even gets out of the car. He doesn't listen to Zosha's panicked warnings and then turns his back on a victim slash attacker carrying a giant battle axe. You'd think he would have pulled out his gun the second he realized he ran over the diseased version of the mountain. The rest of this scene plays out like a calamity of airs. Why is this cop car a piece of garbage all of a sudden? It was just running a minute ago, and the cop never even turned it off. Also, my glimmer of respect for this ogre vanishes the second he decides to climb over the car rather than coming around to her unlocked door. Zoja makes the correct choice to speed ahead and clear the ogre off the car, but backing over him to double tap may damage this crappy car even further, or high center it. And there's no telling if a second or third love tap with this car will do anything to him at all. Again, if we're choosing violence here, maybe knock him off the car, back up to the mangled mess of policemen, grab the gun he couldn't get out of his holster in time, then mag dump into the ogre's head until it's a fine crimson mist on the asphalt. These unfortunate campers had their work cut out for them once the basement twins escaped their confines and went on the hunt for fresh meat. Daniel had no way of putting up a fight here, trapped in his sleeping bag and broken against a tree. I give him a survivor score of 1 out of 5, if only because we'll never know how he would have fared on his feet. At least he got lucky before he died. Mizzo was an infuriatingly incompetent camp counselor who prioritized the return of one kid over the safety of the rest of her group. And then she grabbed a stick instead of escaping with her life. I award her a survivor score of 0 out of 5, and may God have mercy on her soul. And Yella never stood a chance, being ambushed from behind by a silent giant. Much like Daniel, because we never got to see her in a fight, she gets a survivor score of 1 out of 5. Simply for fighting and trying to save Zoja, Ulick gets a survivor score of 2 out of 5. As a fellow horror nerd, he will be missed for the next 5 seconds. Bartek is probably the biggest disappointment of them all. He survived a frisky priest and a run-in with a mutant twin, only to die at the hands of a senile shut-in. I'll give him a survivor score of 2.5 out of 5. Finally, we have Zoja. I'd like to give her a top score for that badass bed gutting and double tap with the car, but she made just as many mistakes and bad choices as anyone else, and luck played a big part in why she lived to tell the tale. She receives a generous survivor score of 3 out of 5. They're just lucky these two big boys didn't also turn into telepathic wendigos. Ultimately, four of the five campers and Iza would have made it back alive if they had simply returned to the main camp after Daniel's disappearance. With that in mind, I think the yogurt twins from Nobody Sleeps in the Woods Tonight were beat. Moral of the story, flight will keep you alive a lot longer than fight. And don't miss my next video, where we go on a private island big game hunting trip that goes horribly wrong. Watch the video on the left to see how to properly annihilate an invasive mutant population.